Good morning and welcome back to TPI's Aspen Forum. This morning we are delighted to have with us Chase Koch and Maurice Ferre for a conversation on their collaboration to bring disruptive medical technology and health innovation to market. As an investor and president of Koch Disruptive Technologies, or KDT, an investment unit of Koch Industries, Chase Koch looks for opportunities to partner with companies that develop technologies to disrupt a broad array of industries, from medical technology and consumer goods to cloud computing, among others. One of the KDT portfolio companies is Insight Tech, a private company that develops incisionless surgical technology that uses focused ultrasound guided by MRI to treat essential tremor and tremor-dominant Parkinson's disease. The technology is also in clinical trials for epilepsy, glioblastoma, Alzheimer's disease, and opioid addiction. Dr. Maurice Ferre is CEO and Chairman of the Board of Directors at Insight Tech. Dr. Ferre has 20 years of experience as a serial entrepreneur in the medical tech industry. Prior to this role, Dr. Ferre served as CEO and Chairman of the Board of Directors of MAKO, uh, um, a transformational robotic surgical company that he co-founded, which was acquired by Stryker Corp for $1.65 billion in 2013. Prior to that, he was founder and CEO of Visualization Technology Incorporated, which is a company that became the world leader in image-guided surgery with a navigation platform for ENT surgery and was acquired by GE Healthcare in 2002. Thank you both for taking time to be with us today um, for a conversation on innovation and investment. To introduce our audience to Insight Tech, we have a short two-minute video fo on focused ultrasound. So here's the video. Acoustic energy is transforming healthcare in unique and profound ways. By providing innovative treatments and therapies for our minds and bodies. From essential tremor and Parkinson's to glioblastoma and Alzheimer's, we want to transform people's health to help them go from life-threatening to life-changing. The essential tremor for me has really put a damper on my life. If there's anything I can do, then I should do it. I googled focused ultrasound and I looked at what was out there about this and it interested me because this is non-invasive and I thought if if this can help my tremor, by God, by all means, I will do it. I will do it. I will be able to live the rest of my life doing the things that I once loved and can do again. How do you feel? I feel wonderful. I don't believe it. Amazing. When you wake Amazing. up tomorrow morning and it's still not shaking, you'll believe it. Let's take you to see your husband. Oh, honey, the rest of our life is going to be normal. We're so happy for you. We're so happy for you. Well, Dr. Ferre, that's a great video. Um, Insight Tech's technology is being used by major medical centers and academic hospitals here in the US, as well as abroad in Israel, Europe, Japan, and China, among other countries. Can you tell us about the surgical technology and what it means to use sound waves instead of a scalpel? Is it safe? Is it effective? Well, thank you very much, and um, thank you for the opportunity to be here to uh, to present our story. Um, we have been working on transformative technology for many years, and Insight Tech is an example of a, of a technology that came out of Israel 20 years in the making, and we truly believe it has the potential to really change the way we look at healthcare. 
and the way we treat a lot of different diseases. We've identified now with the, um, the Focus Ultrasound Foundation over 138 indications where the use of acoustic energy of sound can be used in the body without incision to treat all these different types of diseases. And what you saw in the video is an example of one indication, which is movement disorders or essential tremor that affects 11 million people. Um, and we are in the commercial phase of treatment of this disease. Um, and the awareness is, is where we're at, where we finally work years and years of work of building up clinical data, years of work working with the regulators, the FDA, the CMS, and get awareness. And we finally, this is the first year that we're making this treatment available to many, many people. And we're hearing these type of stories. Um, and this is what really is exciting for us, is that we can, we can provide a, a platform of a new uh, technology um, that is in the makings that uses the uniqueness of an MR machine so we can visualize right on the spot anywhere in the body, but in our, we're focused on the brain. And then we could uh, use this acoustic energy that, that comes and targets very specific parts of the brain and at certain frequencies and different intensities, it goes through the skull and all, it's the sum of the parts. It, the, the 1,000 elements of energies all come to a focal point that are, that's steerable. Um, and then we can create what's called a lesion. And we're, in, in this case, we're treating patients that are where we're treating in the thalamus, um, which is the central uh, nuclei for a lot of these um, movement diseases, movement disorders. And we're able to treat um, on the spot. And as you can see, it's a, it's a one hour, two hour treatment and it's immediate. The effects are immediate. The patients walk out uh, without these these tremors, which in in many cases is is life changing. So we're very excited about having uh, built that platform, and and we're off and developing many other indications. Wow. Um, how how did you discover that? So so um, you know, like a lot of these things, um, a lot of it is a combination of of merging technology um, with clinical indications of understanding how these these things work. Um, we were um, working originally on using this concept because it, if you think about it, right, in terms of treating different diseases, um, using energy is is not is has been has been around for a while. I mean, we have, for example, radiation therapy. Right, where, where we've developed proton beams. The difference of what we, I think, captured was using non-ionizing energy, ultrasound. So when you think of ultrasound, most people think of ultrasound in terms of looking at um, babies and seeing imaging or diagnostics. Um, but what we realized was that using non-ionizing was a very challenging element to actually be able to penetrate through the skull. So that breakthrough was a, was a major breakthrough that took place on, on that discovery of being able to do that. So it was the advancement of the science the, and understanding the physics to be able to do that. Many people have been attempting to do this, but it's one of these things that there was always um, this whole unleashing of energy sources and frequencies that can have an impact. And, and if you think about it, what this is really all about is, is, is this concept of going from mechanical to molecular. I mean, when we go back 20 years, 30 years from now, and we see the way we do surgeries and opening up and doing these type of procedures, and you see the evolution of how um, these, our treatments have taken place, um, big open incisions, then we started seeing things like cameras, like laparoscopics, and then we started seeing robotics. This is the ultimate. This is the ability of, from the external sources to be able to, to be able to use energy sources to go from mechanical to molecular, to be able to do things without even going inside the body. Um, and the fact that we do it inside, um, not a surgical suite, but we do it inside an MRI machine, 
um, allows the, the, the surgeon and, and the team to actually visualize in real time and have what's called a closed loop system. So, it's, so all that technology was, it was, it was an involvement over the last 20 years of, of creation. Um, and, and it was just a lot of, a lot of tenacity, hard work, of, uh, and, and a continuation. And we're very early in the cycle of what this, what this magnitude potential of changing the way we, we deliver healthcare is gonna take place. That's awesome. And Chase Cook, thank you for being here. Um, thank you. How did you decide to invest in InsightTech and incisionless <coughs> surgery? Coke Disruptive Technologies is a unique investment unit under Coke Industries that invests in a number of highly innovative startups. Um, what in your investment philosophy aligns with InsightTech and Maurice's team? Well, I mean, I think uh, InsightTech and the way um, uh, Maurice described it and also seeing that video, you can see why uh, you know, a company like Coke would be so excited about getting behind it. Um, <clears throat> You know, when we uh, first got the call on the opportunity back in 2017 and our, our team uh, went up to Sunnybrook in uh, Toronto, which is where they were, they were uh, uh, doing some of these procedures, uh, it was basically all the diligence we needed to do on the opportunity. When you see, we saw a woman uh, go into, you know, that procedure and uh, an hour and a half later come out. And this was a woman that had, um, you know, 20 years of essential tremor. And where she, you know, she would be in bed and just uncontrollable tremor. So she dealt with this affliction, her, you know, pretty much her entire life. And then to see her come out of the procedure and the, the ability to shake her hand and her life being completely transformed, I mean, that's, there's there's nothing more transformative than that, right? And so, again, that was that was kind of that was it for us. And um, it actually helped because I, I launched uh, Coke Disruptive Technologies right at the same time. When, the, when we got the call on, on Inside Tech, and uh, it helped us really shape the vision of the type of companies we were looking for. And um, you know, why life sciences for Coke, maybe I'll take a step back from, from KDT and, and talk about really a transformation that Coke Industries has been going through the last five or six years. Um, you know, my grandfather started Coke Industries really um, based on, uh, on fossil fuels and logistics and refining and, you know, making gasoline, jet fuel, um, diesel um, type products. But uh, over time, you know, we recognized that we needed to transform and get into, into uh, different industries. And if you look at Coke Industries today, we're in 11 different platforms. Um, we, we operate in 70 countries and have 130,000 employees across we operate across the majority of the economy. But five or six years ago, we looked at our portfolio and said most of our, um, most of our assets and where we're creating value is industrial. And we recognized that we needed to transform from being an industrial company to a technology company. Otherwise, a lot of our uh, businesses would become dinosaurs. And, uh, and you know, Joseph Schumpeter's creative destruction model would take over if, if you're not destroying yourself, the market will. And so we've, um, just in the last uh, five or six years, um, invested over $30 billion to try to, to drive that transformation. And so examples include, you know, um, buying an ERP software company, N4, to really help Coke transition to be a software company and apply software in new and different ways across our industrial platforms. We also bought a company called Molex uh, five or six years ago that is really the heart of uh, the IoT world and really help us connect our factories in ways that could add more value, understand what was going, run them safer, more reliably. Et cetera. And so all of our, our um, companies are going through this transformation. And so KDT, uh, when I launched that in 2017, it was with a vision of how could we be the preferred partner to the most disruptive entrepreneurs in the world that have technology uh, like Maurice's um, that are basically going to reshape the, the future and how these, these, uh, these industries work. And, um, and so uh, one of the roles of KDT was not, we, we had kind of three outcomes that we're trying to create with our investments. One is we're trying to disrupt our core businesses. An example of that would be getting into electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles that would disrupt basically my grandfather's business that started back in the 40s. Um, and um, the other one is to transform our core capabilities. 
So whether it's logistics, manufacturing, what, whatever it is, how do we make that better? So automation, robotics, we may have a lot of investments there. And then the third one, and this is where life sciences fit, is get Coke Industries into completely new platforms and new areas that we haven't been in before, but where we have capabilities where we can add value. And med tech and life sciences was a completely new area. So it was serendipitous that um, you know Maurice called Coke and, um, and you know, said, hey, there's an opportunity here to invest. And so why is this a sweet spot uh, for KDT? I'll just kind of give the framework for how we look at companies and why, it, why Insight Tech was, was so perfect for us. The first one is we look at, we want to find principled disruptive entrepreneurs. So I'll embarrass Maurice here a little bit, but he fit that mold perfectly. And um, not only, we, we knew he had an aligned values um, with him, um, and how he's demonstrated to run businesses and build businesses, uh, just given the, the resume that you walk through, three-time founder, very successful founder, um, but also his vision and his passion, passion for his vision and uh, the team that he's built around him. So that's one. The second one is we look for um, level of disruptiveness. So when you look at, uh, Maurice talked about it, but when you look at um, basically what this does to a patient, for a patient, in terms of transforming their life and extending their life, but also quality of life, you can't even put a price on that. But at the same time, it's cheaper for the patient versus deep brain stimulation, uh, which is the alternative to, a, to address the central tremor. So when we looked at that, I was like, this is, this is some of the most disruptive technology we've ever looked at. And then the, the third um, kind of criteria that we look at is potential. And when you look at, um, you know, this, the video just covered a central tremor, but Maurice talked about, you know, there's 4,000 disorders in the brain that a central tremor, or that, um, sorry, focused ultrasound could potentially address. Maurice talked about 138 indications that they've already demonstrated, you know, and have some kind of um, experimental uh, technology around focused ultrasound on. So when you think about that, this uh, Insight Tech could be the next uh, you know, Da Vinci uh, technolo robotics technology. And uh, with, with what Intuitive Surgical has, has built there, or even larger than that. So when you look at multiple shots on goal and the ability to transform hundreds of millions of lives with technology, that's, um, that's, that's obviously right in our sweet spot. And then the last one is uh, mutual benefit. We look at, can Coke Industries add value beyond just writing a check? Because um, you know, we, we've, we've poured a lot of capital um, into, into Maurice and his team and his business model, but we want to be able to help with all those various uh, companies and platforms and capabilities that we have in a way that where he can unlock his potential faster. And so that's, you know, we, all four of those really kind of lined up and we checked all those boxes and that, that's, that's really kind of how we think about investing and um, just proud to, proud to align with, with a guy like Maurice and his team. That's fascinating. Um, I'm curious, who are your competitors? Are there other companies that are doing focused ultrasound and how big is the market? I've, I've heard of intuitive, intuitive surgical. Um, what is your business climate like? Well, um, you know, I think what's, what's unique about what we do is um, we're the only company right now in the world that's doing this uh, at this scale. Um, there, 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 are, there are attempts of using this technology, uh, but in the brain on how we do it, um, we're the only company in the world that's doing this. And, um, and it has taken an enormous amount of capital um, to do this, um, you know, we've 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 invested now, you know, close to five hundred million dollars into this technology over the years, and there's 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 so much more that has to be done um, that we're starting to see some really important signals of it's not you know on how to use this technology, um, and you know we we talked a little about the treatment of movement disorders, but Imagine if we could um, treat diseases like Alzheimer's, which we know is going to have a massive impact in our healthcare system. It's estimated by the year 2028, 20% of our, of our GDP is going to be um, healthcare. Um, that's a problem. Um, and we're gonna be spending over $6 trillion 
They're estimating that Alzheimer's alone could take a quarter of that budget um, because we don't have any any signals of where we're doing. We've started an initiative on trials where we're opening up the blood-brain barrier at a specific frequency, and we're seeing where we're starting to have some some impact on, on animal trials. This is a far, far way of saying that there might be alternative therapies other than medication and drugs for these types of diseases. We're starting to see it, the same type of work in other diseases like Parkinson's. We have work that's going on in West Virginia on opiate addiction, where by targeting a specific area in the brain, we, it's an on-off switch, and it's a modulating effect. So we're learning a Matt, lot. I'm sorry to interrupt you. That one, it, to me, is just mind-blowing. You think about uh, the skyrocketing addiction rates, especially post-COVID, um, and people battling addiction, I mean, just globally. And if you could put them in a machine like this and know exactly where the spot, spot in the brain that causes the addiction and be able to, to address that in, in a matter of an hour... I mean, that is just, I don't mean to interrupt you, Maurice, yeah. but it, it just, it really blows your mind of the possibilities here. And, and um, you know, so, so we're unleashing this technology and in ways in a, in a very, in very systematic way because we're seeing, and it's not us as a company, it's, it's really the academic communities around us that have, that have bought in. It's, it's the buy-in of the NIH that's been very supportive of trials, it's the it's the work of the Focus Ultrasound Foundation in in Charlottesville that that has put hundreds of millions of dollars in trials um, in 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 this this type of work. So there's a there's a there's an eagerness and a um, a, a a pace where we have to try to understand some of these diseases. That are affecting us and are gonna and and where we think that the solutions are 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 drugs. There's a lot of things we're learning. I think one of the biggest breakthroughs that we're learning in the life sciences is is is, is obviously immunotherapy. And um, in in that world, what we're learning about using and stimulating energy is that in in in, in diseases um, like glioblastoma or diseases like brain metastasis. And these are life sentences of, you know, with GBM, you have a 15-month um, sentence. I mean, that it's, it's, it's a horrible disease. And in the last 20-plus years, there has been nothing. There's been no, no change in the way that we treat patients. It, it's, it's, you know, we've seen the deaths of, you know, Ted Kennedy and Bo Biden and John McCain is just examples of how horrible this disease is. Um, and, and, and similarly, diseases like ALS is the same type of thing. We're sorry to see these types of diseases that are just life-threatening, and there's no, there's no cure. There's nothing in the frontier. And what we're finding in our early trials is that um, in combination with immunotherapy, by using focus ultrasound and targeting the areas and priming the area, that you're creating a stronger immune response so that your body knows actually how to attack it. Um, and, and we're allowing drugs to go into the brain in higher concentrations that you normally don't see. One of the biggest problems with treating the brain is you have, you have this uh, blood-brain barrier that, that uh, doesn't allow drugs to get into the brain, which is a good thing um, in terms of making sure that, that uh, the, the brain is well protected. But it's also uh, from an opportunity to try to design and develop uh, treatments they can't do that. So now we have a technology. We've treated now over 300 patients where we can open up the, the blood-brain barrier and allow drugs to go in a very concentrated area. All these types of opportunities are, are kind of in the forefront, and we really are kind of the only company right now that's, that's doing this. Um, and it takes, it's really important that we team up with the right people. And for when we made the decision to... Um, work with with uh, uh, with Coke it, it, it was really a very um, it was more than the you know KDT brought to us not just um, the the financing um, they brought the mindset of you know how to work how to scale 
how to look at things, um, you know, in terms of how, from a government perspective, of, of working with uh, lobbyists um, in, in, in advocacy groups, and, and because there's a lot of work that has to be done here, and, and, um, and awareness, the awareness campaigns for us is really, really important. So that so that we can we can move the science faster, so that we can move the technology faster, um, and prove these things out. Um, we have enough signals that there's enough out there. It's just we need more of it. We need more people working, and we need more more scientists working on this stuff. Um, you know, and and I can tell you at the university levels, you know, we need more we need more PhDs. We need more engineers. We need more scientists, um, and and we have to go at a at a faster pace than what we're doing. Um, a lot of this is is kind of is stemmed out of out of Israel, and that's where the innovation has started. But the clinical evidence is global. Um, we're now working with all of the top academic centers around the world, and we need to be starting to put more funding in place for this type of technology. Great. So we have a few questions. Um, so sure. now's a good time, I think, to um, ask them. The medical device business is extremely heavily regulated. How did that affect your ability to get into the market? And I'm curious to hear more. Like, what are the hurdles? You know, clinical trials, I'm sure they're testing um, risks. And yeah. um, could you explain a little bit more how hard it is to get something yeah. new to market? I mean, it, it, usually any disease takes us seven to 10 years to get to market, every one of these. And, and they, have, they have a cost of probably about 50 to $100 million on each one. And in, you know, I think that there's no shortcuts in clinical data. I, I, you know, look, we, we go through a process of going first, first we establish the technology, right? We, 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 we work in the lab, in, in the dry labs, and just getting the technology to do certain things. Once we have that capability of the technology, you know, where you know it's very complicated stuff. You know, we're inside a scanner. The, the, there's this is a big magnet, so it has to be non-magnetic, and then and then we have to, so we have to make all these switches, um, and then we have to be able to take this energy source of acoustic energy, and we have to go through the skull, and and usually going through the skull, there's heating, so there's physics behind that. So we have to understand all those dynamics, um, and then there's there's scatter, right? The the beams, the beam formations. Don't don't all go to the same spot. So we have to do corrections and algorithms and establish all that stuff. But once you kind of get all that, and then you have different frequencies that you have to work. And there's a lot of advancements and all that stuff. That that's that's once you have that core element of technology put together, the the thing that we go through is we go through preclinical data where we're we're going through uh, animal trials, animal studies. We work with a lot of different academic institutions around the world that allow us to, to test on the animal models. We have to create models, and we have to be convinced that we can go after different types of uh, diseases. Once you have that conviction, and then all of a sudden you, you go to the, um, the, um, the first in human, and, and we're, we're, we are the most advanced, you know, we're, we're, a, we're, a, we're a class three device, so we're under PMA, under the highest rigor regulations. Um, so we go through enormous amount of, of, of paperwork and processes from the FDA that allows that we need to we need to fill out. That could take up to six months to a year just to kind of design a trial. That's really kind of a feasibility trial, which is only like ten patients and being highly monitored. Um, and then once we kind of pass that hurdle, and then we have to design a you know a, what we call a phase three trial, which is usually these blinded trials. And then we have to track our patients on an indication at least four to five years. Um, and then once we get that data in place, um, then um, you know, we have to get to the hurdle of uh, CMS. And hospitals, as great as the technology is and the multi-million dollar and the support that you have from, from industry and from, and from um, you know, your, the, uh, the professional societies that all buy into this, and you have brilliantly designed level one trials with controlled arms um, and and a lot of rigor and outside monitoring. Um, you 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 get stuck because uh, reimbursement. Hospitals don't invest in the reimbursement side. You know, they have they have to find a way to to reimburse um, this type of procedure. Um, so these are the the hurdles, and it's not just in the U.S. It's global. It's like how do you how do you do this? We, you know, we we for years 
was were developing this technology, and what slowed us down in treating 11 million people with essential tremors reimbursements. It's like, you know, we finally got CMS, and this is where, you know, some of the advocacy group of just being able and just educating and awareing politicians in particular that help form policy and advocacy groups like Avamet have been very helpful. Um, and, and working with Coke KDT and their team has been helpful in terms of getting that word out because these are these are the hurdles that we 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 go through um, on every disease. And and think about how long it's gonna take for us to do that when we're as 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 Chase said, there's four thousand diseases that we can be targeting. Yes, Chase, could you talk a little bit more about the support that KDT provides on the regulatory side? It seems like venture capitalists could be in tech, they could be in many areas. Why would you pick such a difficult area yeah. as medical devices? Well, uh, let me first kind of address what uh, Maurice was talking about a little bit and the, the question that, that uh, someone from the audience put in around the whole regulatory environment. Um, I mean, Maurice addressed specifically Insight Tech and his experiences there, seven to 10 year process, really high cost um, to get that through. I mean, I, I, from my standpoint, obviously it's not just Insight Tech, that's all medical technology, life sciences. So I think when you look at, the, at that world, um, there's one of the biggest opportunities that we have in society is to figure out how do you transform more lives faster, right, in, the, in this medical world. And um, I think, uh, f like, philosophically, we have to have a paradigm shift in terms of how we think about things. I think right now, if you look at the way um, uh, the FDA or other organizations, all the ones that Maurice went through, approach um, a new technology like Insight Tech, it's very top-down and very prescriptive, one-size-fits-all approach to regulating that and all the, the hoops that you have to jump through. So I think if we can change the paradigm from top down to bottom up and where you have more um, flexible, um, I guess, frameworks in place that still you have frameworks for safety and you have ways to do that, <laughs> but you let innovation happen from the bottom up. And just a couple of examples um, that I, I think are really interesting here. Um, on, if you look at the history of innovation, I, uh, some of the most revolutionary innovations came from the bottom up. If you look at the Wright brothers, for example, in the, in the airplane in the early 1900s, at the same time, there was all these uh, government programs pouring uh, a lot of capital into how do we get the first airplane done. Um, but it was the Wright brothers that were basically bike mechanics that were working on you know, how, how bikes balance and then how, how, do you, um, how do you apply what they learned from the bicycle to an airplane and what we got the first airplane off the ground. So I know it maybe seems like a silly example, but no top-down solution is gonna say, okay, let's go find the Wright brothers and wherever they were, Ohio, to, to figure that out, right? And then if you look at a more recent example um, with COVID testing, um, and when, when COVID hit, um, the CDC um, initially wanted to basically control the, the basically all testing and the supply of tests and make sure that everything you know went through this very prescriptive kind of one size fits all approach when I think you know they very quickly realized we need to open this up to the market because there's all sorts of innovations and entrepreneurs out there that have new technologies that can solve this problem that's right here right now and if we don't do that I mean obviously lives are at stake. Um, and, and one example of that is uh, uh, two friends of mine, um, Tyler Cowan and then uh, Patrick Collison, who's the founder of uh, Stripe, uh, leader in the fintech world, uh, came up with this program called Fast Grants. And so what they said is, instead of a top-down prescriptive approach to here's exactly the way a COVID test needs to work, um, it's a very broad framework. And like, if you have any ideas, you'll get 10 to 20,000 you know, within 30 minutes fill out this half page form and off you go. And what came out of that was the first spit test that, that um, you know, we, we all you know, saw like, how does the NBA uh, playing right now, right? And they did the whole dome thing. They only were able to do that because of the spit test technology. And, uh, and so it's just another example of top down versus bottom up that I think is a really good one. And I think the, that ties to the paradigm shift of, we're gonna unlock uh, a lot more innovation and help people transform their lives faster 
if we empower people from the bottom up to find, to find innovations instead of having a prescriptive uh, top-down approach. And what this really kind of speaks to is uh, you know, evolving from um, where we have, um, you know, we, we apply technology through the lens of the precautionary principle where you've got to make sure that everything is, is safe, but also everything is, the technology works, it's been well tested, and it's efficacious. So when you have, um, from a top-down standpoint, prescriptive ways of what's effective, that's what drives this to seven to 10 years. We need a safety framework, there's no doubt about it, but how do you shift from a precautionary principle mindset to one of permissionless innovation? and get closer to that where you have a general framework, but at the same time, you know, you're, you're empowering people from the bottom up. So anyway, I think this, uh, the, I know it's a big topic for, I'm, I'm sure, the last couple days here, but uh, it, we're not going to be able to capture the opportunity that Maurice is talking about unless we make significant changes. And I think COVID forced us to make those changes, and, the, the, you know, the COVID test is just one example of it. Do you think it's a combination of making it faster, like shortening that time frame, seven to 10 years to sh a shorter amount of time, but also having investors like yourself with long-term long -term vision? I mean, is it both? Well, I think um, there will be more capital um, chasing opportunities like Insight Tech um, if obviously the timelines are shorter because there's more opportunity, right? And not only from uh, attracting new capital in to, to get a, a return quicker, um, but but also just from um, um, if you look at the overall cost on the the healthcare system, um, because it, obviously if Maurice's costs continue to go up to, you know, and all the trials that he has to run to to basically um, you know get sign off from all these agencies, um, that cost flows through the system. Right, and that's, that's bad for the overall healthcare um, system and for patients as well. We want low cost, affordable care so everyone can have access to focused ultrasound technology. Great, and I guess one final wrap up since we're around time. Um, what's your long term vision for Insight Tech? Are you going to keep it private? Are you going to, you know, uh, what, as a VC investor and as an uh, operator? So, you know, I, I think what, what I'm excited about is I, I've never in my life, in my career, seen anything like what this can be. Um, I really, this is a platform. I mean, I, I, we didn't even get into a lot of the other diseases, but, you know, I, I think if we can have an impact on, on a disease that is so, as a life sentence, like a glioblastoma, and GBM, and I think we can know that really soon, right? So it's just like we got to keep on pushing and pushing, and get these get these regulators to to buy into our trials. We're almost there. We finally, you know, we finally got, you know, the right people at the table, the right scientists, the right the right folks that are looking at that. And I, and I think that there's so much of that opportunity that has to be done. And and I think we have a platform to do it. We. To me, it's about just doing it faster and faster, and it's about how many lives we can save, how many, how we can change and transform the way healthcare is being delivered, how we can reduce significantly the way the costs are 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 pivoting. This should not be. We're still in a fee for service cost. As much as we talk about it, incentives are all around that. But imagine if you actually have. These these out out of patient you know you're not in the hospital you're it's an out outpatient facility you go inside this machine it does something to you and you're out in two three hours and that's it that there those we those are the types of diseases that we're trying to manage where you where you create a death sentence and 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 a debilitating disease and you you make it a a a, a just a chronic disorder um, you treat it there and there's hope and there's longevity and we've seen it happen in other types of breakthroughs in technologies with immunotherapy and other types of diseases that are curable, that have become curable. Um, we need to do that. We need to focus on these big diseases that are, that are life sentences. And, and, um, and I think that our, you know, we, we want to continue to, to be there, to do it, and use the resources that we need to get it done. Uh, so we, we don't think about it as, you know, exits and this and that. We just think about it of you know, how, how we can continue to grow and make, make, make progress. Because the value comes at the end of the day. You know, obviously we have shareholders. But, all, all, but you know, if you, do, if you do good, 
um, and you know, all all things, all other good things happen. Maurice, how many lives do you think you can touch with this technology? We think we two hundred million is what our focus is. We think we can impact two hundred million lives in this technology. Great. Well, thank you, um, both Chase and Maurice, for your morning. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Sure.